Uh, the Lord's always got a few things in play. And uh, so when Bob phoned me and goes, I haven't even started my sermon yet, I'm like, well, when do you think I'm going to start? <laughs> so, uh, but as I got into the sermon and he assigned me a text, uh, it was clear to me that, oh my goodness, uh, you know, the beauty of being a pastor and, uh, is you get to preach every week and the Lord gets to speak to you in a new and fresh way because you have to deliver this in front of his people. And, uh, and usually he wants to work in you and by his grace, uh, he shares that with someone else. But I run a Bible camp now, so I don't preach every week. Matter of fact, I don't preach barely ever anymore. And, uh, and so God interrupted my busy life to give me a sermon for me. Uh, I've been holding my forgiveness with an individual, and it's been ripping me apart. And, uh, and, and so this one's about me today. And maybe by God's grace, uh, it'll be about you. Uh, I'm not sure. I, selfishly, I'm okay with what is right now. The Lord put me in this text uh, for me, and, um, and um, I've got to make my resolve and uh, do something with it. Uh, but by God's grace, maybe you've done the same thing that I have, and he will speak through you. So no, 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 uh, no surprise that Bob got sick. Uh, no surprise that uh, his little organized world kind of was, had to shuffle here and there. No surprise uh, that he brought me here, because uh, that's just sometimes the way the Lord works. Uh, again, Tim Biquette, I run Sunny Bay Bible Camp, which is your Bible camp, and um, the Lord's just doing something special out there. Uh, registration, everybody asks, how's it going? Uh, in the last number of years, it's just been skyrocketing, and this year in a unique way from what's even been. And so if you're thinking about going, I'm going to give you a little nudge from the director. Uh, I brought some brochures. Get your deposit. Get your name on the list because we are going to fill up very quick this year in a new way, ways that we never have before. And, uh, and we just love to serve our local churches and communities, and so we don't want for you to miss out on that opportunity for your kids to be in a place of compressed discipleship all week long, uh, led by students who just absolutely uh, love the Lord. So, and the Lord's doing some neat things in Miller, too. We just had our, uh, you know, de declare your intention Monday. Uh, are you coming back to school or not? And school's kind of in a perfect world of reach for a 50% return rate. Uh, Melissa, our PR gal, what was our percentage of return rate? So again, maybe we would say, if you're thinking about going to Bible school, uh, get your name in quickly uh, because we have every sense that we're going to fill up next year. God's just done an extraordinary thing. Uh, it's your camp, um, 365 days a year. It's a place where the Bible is opened and read and studied. Uh, you know what I think the return rate has to do with, both in the summer camp for kids and the Bible school, is just the fact that that place is grounded in this book. Uh, I've been asking young people for years and years and years, what's your favorite part about camp? And, uh, and much to your surprise, it's not the boats or the horses or the food or any of these other things. It's the teaching. Uh, I like it when the guy up front says stuff, you know, sometimes that innocently. And, uh, and so God is filling the place up because this is the way that he will draw his own to himself. And he will invite them to a camp or to a church uh, or to the proximity of yourself, a follower of Jesus. Uh, and he will extend that invitation, that nudge by his spirit. He will open their eyes and they will see and become transformed. Lord, is wearing your text this morning. Lord, I simply ask that you do in these people's hearts what you've clearly chose to do in mine this week. Uh, Lord, forgiveness is uh, quite a subject. Uh, it's the context of the gospel. Uh, Lord, but it relates not just between God and man, but between man and man. And so, uh, Lord, speak to us as we're in your word this morning. Um, the text assigned to me uh, is just in keeping with where you've been. I assume I haven't been here myself, but uh, it can't be read and understood uh, apart from its former verses. And so I want to read where you've been uh, out of Matthew. Um, there's my page. And I'm just getting used to a new set of glasses here, my first set of glasses. Never really had to preach with them before, so they might go on and off and on and off at a point where it's distracting. Uh, we'll try. Uh, Matthew 6, uh, 9 through the end. Uh, 9 through 15. Pray then in this way, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And our text this morning uh, which needs to be read and understood in the context of everything prior. For if you forgive men their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, then your Father will not forgive 
your transgressions. Bit of a t- time of transition here. Uh, we are kind of trapped between the, the, the Old and the New Testament. Uh, the Old becoming a collection of God's response to fallen humanity. And we are left with a clear sense of what God likes and what he dislikes. Ultimately, we see his requirement of righteousness through the Old Testament and his heart of grace in the Old Testament, but made new and fresh in un- understanding to the New Testament. And there's recognition in the Lord's Prayer. It begins with, hallowed be your name, holy be your name. Jesus transplant all of God's holiness into this age of grace. He's not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. The fury of the Old Testament was satisfied on the cross. Have you ever wondered about all the fury of the Old Testament? Uh, Many of my non-believing friends are like, man, if that's God, I don't want any part. He seems angry. Uh, in Sunday school, they taught me the story about the jawbone and uh, the, the, the guys just going kind of crazy. Uh, they should have never taught me that in Sunday school because it's my reoccurring dream all the time. I use a rock or a stick and I should see therapy about it, I'm sure. Uh, but something happens, I get angry in my sleep, and I just start killing people left, right, and center. I probably shouldn't have told you that, right? Just disqualified myself from ever preaching here again. Uh, but you have this sense of the Old Testament. It's like, oh my goodness, the righteousness of God goes out into the nations and there's a fury about it you can't love righteousness without hating unrighteousness and if that's true of us in our small understanding of what it means to be righteous how much more god how much more god hallowed be your name holy is your name thy kingdom come jesus instructs that our life is to be one of mission to participate Uh, the enlargement of the kingdom of God, to be a part of what it means to bring it to here into this planet and to participate in it. And it places an appropriate response to as many who would become citizens of this kingdom to be subjects worthy of his calling. Thy will be done. The holy God of heaven gets say over his subjects. God, help me to be one who ushers in your kingdom, not my own, and so protect that I don't make it about my own will. That's not a bad idea for a guy who has dreams about killing everybody with a jawbone. (laughs) You don't want it to be about my will. And you know what? Incidentally, I don't want it to be about your will. We don't want it to be about a child's will because that would be juvenile and reckless. And we don't want it to be an old person's will because it might be sleepy and meandering. We need it to be about God's will and not our own if it's going to be a kingdom that is the one God pictured and invited us to. Holy God of heaven. Help me to establish your kingdom. Help me to reach for your will. Why? Because I, by nature, have a my king heart. Help me to have a King Jesus heart. Why? Because I, by nature, have a my will heart. Help me to have a your will heart. He goes on just in review before we get into our text. Give us this day our daily bread. Essentially, he's saying, as you pray, ask that I fund the mission, my mission in your life. Help me to trust that you're a good king. We're always concerned about our politics, really at a money level, because we we need our jobs and we need the economy to be doing well. And here in this kingdom, God establishes himself as king. And so he brings in appropriately in economics to go, ask me to be the one to provide for your very physical needs. And now as we approach our text and forgive us our debt as we have forgiven our debtors. Initially in the prayer, in the instruction of how to pray, Jesus dealt with a theology, spoke to a new way of relating to King Jesus in this age of grace. And now he introduces the currency of the kingdom, which is food and shelter, daily bread and forgiveness. He deals with the currency of our physical needs and now this morning, the spiritual needs that we all have. What are the demands of our spiritual needs? Ultimately, we all owe God, a perfect life. The fury of the Old Testament, the fury of a righteous God has not changed one bit. I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And so that fury has to be placed in some spot. It's the currency required for the transaction to be a part of this kingdom. We all owe God a perfect life. And we know that it is absolutely impossible that we pay it. 
if we want to be a part of this glorious kingdom, if we expect to fall under the grace of a holy God rather than his righteous fury, then we have to understand that the cross needed to be that place of fury in our place. Does it help us understand this thing where Jesus teaches us? He says, forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And now our text this morning after a long introduction For if you forgive men their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Whoa. Any flags going off in your mind right now? (laughs) Any kind of like, hey, wait a minute, this is not what I signed up for. We're a Baptist church. Uh, What about unconditional? What about unmerited? What about all of these things, the age of grace? Uh, You're preaching something quite different I'm not preaching anything different. These are the words of Jesus. Reinforce words after his instruction of this is then how you should pray. He's already flown through the prayer piece of forgiveness. And now at the end, he spends as much time as he did in the entire prayer making these statements. What about undeserving favor? What about by grace alone? We hold fast to a theology of abounding grace, even eternal security. Uh, We've grown up with this scripture that says that there's nothing, absolutely nothing that can separate us from the love of God. We proclaim Jesus' righteousness, that the fury of the cross was fully satisfied. Our debt, this debt that we had to pay, which was a perfect life to be a part of this kingdom. That the great cost of our sin has been satisfied by the precious blood of Christ. We celebrate people like the convert on the cross, the thief on the cross, who is as guilty as you can possibly get. And in the last moments of life, he simply looks over and says, Jesus, would you remember me? And we get a clear and high sense of Jesus going, you're forgiven. Everything is forgiven in but a moment. And today you will be with me in paradise. A man with no time to confess to his victims, no time to pay it back. A man with no time to live a life of serving Jesus. That was lost to him on that cross. Moments later, he would have died. That's the kind of forgiveness that we preach in a Baptist church. And so what do we do with verses 14 and 15 that get so quickly forgotten as the Lord instructs us how to pray? For if you forgive, your heavenly Father will forgive. (laughs) But if you do not forgive, your Father will not. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is the spiritual currency of the kingdom of God. God's righteousness demands the transaction settled in the sacrifice of his own beloved son. The holy God of the Old Testament was pleased to place his son in our place to establish his kingdom. He purchased you, but he had a mind through that purchase to establish a kingdom where there are you and me, brothers and sisters, the regenerate believers, to make up this kingdom. There are conditions. Conditions of not only of a genuine repentance, but also the requirement of genuine forgiveness. Folks, when you acknowledge that God is holy, When you begin a prayer with our Father, Holy God of Heaven, and when you ask that He establish a rule in your life, when you you pray in sincerity that His will be done in your life, with a resolute heart to allow Christ to be the sacrifice that might gain you access into the kingdom, and then refuse to forgive a brother and sister over a petty thing, and they're all petty in this realm, why? Wouldn't our Christ say, no way, I will not forgive you? What do we do with this? That's getting a little heavy, isn't it? (laughs) Let's make it lighter. Let's talk about my house. 
Uh, I'm by no means the king of my little kingdom called the Paquette family. Uh, there is a king and there's a queen. She's here today. This might be different if she wasn't, but she's here. So today there is definitely king and queen. Matter of fact, her mom is here. So uh, we should put some kind of crown S on that and honor her for, uh, for her contribution and all of these things. Uh, but God has established two sacraments and, and uh, two, two, two holy establishments. That is the family and the church. And you know how much he loves them because how much the devil relents against them. You not feel the attack of Satan on a Bible teaching church. And do you not see and feel the attack of Satan on what we have as a biblical home? A uh, man and a wife and children raised up under the teachings of this word. And we could kind of use this example to kind of, in a micro sense, talk about the macro sense of what it means to be thy kingdom come. This, is, this great kingdom of God that he's established. And while not perfect, my little kingdom, uh, maybe, maybe you could take it from the perspective of my kid. He might pray in a different way uh, if he were kind of conversing with me because a prayer is just a conversation with God, isn't it? And so my kids might say, Dad, uh, not holy dad by any means, um, uh, but the in charge dad, the guy that might give me some money or give me the car uh, or permission to stay out later than I would otherwise get. Uh, I know that this is your micro kingdom. Uh, and I have often wanted my own will to reign, but I'm glad that I don't always get my way. Isn't it a good thing that our kids don't just get their way every single time? You've met a few of those kids who get their way a few more times than they maybe should have and their little holy terrors now. Uh, help me keep this perspective, Dad. Here's the conversation, kind of like the conversation we have with, with our father in that prayer. Uh, thanks for a place to stay and food to eat. So much food. Uh, my, my boys just are, are growing in, in catastrophic ways. I've seen a couple of kids that were here at camp last year, and I'm like, I just know that they've just mowed through your kitchen. When you have a little potluck at church, they're like five, six, seven, eight times in line because there's just so much food. And so my son might say, thanks, Dad, for a place to stay and food to eat. Really, really, really thanks for the food. I do, I do like it. Uh, and Dad, there will be times that you have to forgive me. Um, I get it. Um, I know it has to be that way. I know there has to be forgiveness in our house for this thing to operate in some sense of order. So I'll do my best to forgive my little brother. Now let's get a little perspective here for you as we're going, okay, God has the complexity of establish a kingdom come. And, uh, and they're not unlike the complexities of what it means to have a little kingdom uh, called a family or a little kingdom called of church. Thanks, Dad, for your lead. Uh, otherwise, I'd really become lost in all of life's temptation. Uh, and Dad, thanks for reinforcing your rules about this forgiveness. I think I'm beginning to understand it. As I apply my forgiveness, as I say sorry, um, there's so much more peace. This is such a harmonious place compared to what it would be otherwise. There's a story in the Bible a little later in Matthew. It talks about a king and a kingdom that drives home a point that a good king protects his subjects from themselves and from, his, and from each other. A good king makes provision, a place where the wrongs of that kingdom can be made right. The story is found in Matthew 18, 23. We won't have the time to read it, but to fly through it, and it might jog familiar in your mind because you've been there before with your pastor, I'm sure. But the kingdom... Um, uh, wanted to settle his accounts. And uh, he goes to one of the slaves, uh, the workers at the time, and he goes, um, we need to settle accounts. And the worker goes, there's just no way for me to do it. I just don't have the money. Some of you are in that place right now. Someone might be settling accounts with you, and you're going, oh, oh boy, this is not going to happen. Take everything, but it's still not enough. And so the master says, well, then in order to kind of make this right, because we can't just have everybody with unsettled debts at every point in this little kingdom, uh, I'm going to have to throw you in prison. Um, until it's paid off. Matter of fact, in this case, your wife and your children as well. And the, the slave, the worker goes, don't do it. And he, he appeals for grace and mercy. Please, please, not my family, not my kids. I'll do whatever it takes. I'll pay it off. The master knows that this guy will never be able to pay it off. But in a gracious moment, he goes, you know what? I'm going to cancel your debt completely. 
A couple things going on in the story. The, master, the, the, the worker wants to stay working for the master. It's not just simply, I need to pay this debt. I want to be in this place of work. I want to be a part of your little kingdom. It's been good for me. It's treated me well. You're a good master. And so the master goes, okay, it's done. And he has the power to do so because he's the king of that little kingdom. And he says, it's forgiven. Your debt is zero. The story goes that that guy goes to someone who owes him a small thing. And he says, I need to settle my debt. The guy begs for mercy, but no mercy is given. And he's thrown into jail. The debt that would be impossible to pay is not forgiven. The master hears about this and he is enraged. There's a fury quite like we see in the Old Testament. There's a fury quite like we see shadowed under the cross. And we read terrifying verses in 1834 such as this. And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. Clearly, Jesus is painting a picture of the fury of eternal torment. Verse 14, if you forgive, God will forgive you. Verse 15, if you don't forgive, God will not forgive you. These are the currency of God's kingdom come. A currency that requires, is required for your citizenship. A currency that God expects that is own to embrace. Folks, as we wrap this up, a regenerate heart understands the necessity of of forgiveness in context to hallowed be thy name in context to a holy God. A regenerate heart understands that forgiving another is a great, even a critical response to God's forgiving us. The same Holy Spirit that nudge that we ask him for our first forgiveness, that moment when we see and understand our need and the fury of the cross as the only way to gain access into a relationship with Jesus Christ. That same nudge is the one that will nudge at your heart to forgive a brother or sister here in this realm. If you don't do it, what does that mean and who does that mean you're resisting? It means you're resisting the very spirit that nudged you to ask forgiveness. Dare we say the very evidence of a kingdom dweller depends on it. The pattern of God is that he always makes the first move. He finds us. We find him. It's a good thing because we would never be found minus that truth. The reality of scripture teaches us in 1 John 4, 9, that we love because he has loved us. Our very capacity to love is hingent on the fact that God himself has loved us. And so in keeping with these trends, is it not appropriate in our understanding that we are to forgive because we've been forgiven? Colossians 3, 13 says, Bear with one another and forgive whatever grievances you may have against another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. This week, where do you need to embrace the forgiveness of Christ? This week, where do you need to consider where you might need to actually apply Christ's forgiveness to yourself and just get over that thing that's weighing you down? And importantly today, in context of this word, where do you need to apply God's grace to another? Or do you need to simply say, I'm sorry? Or do you need to say, I forgive you? You don't forgive for them. You don't forgive for you. Rather, you forgive in obedience and in faith to the same Spirit who granted you access to this wonderful kingdom of God. And if you simply cannot, if you cannot in your understanding of the fury of the cross and your great need and your inability to pay, and if you simply cannot forgive another here in this realm, if you simply in your rebellion refuse to, then dare I say out of this book that scripture has made a strong case that you stand outside the kingdom in disobedience, 
that you don't have the faith of Jesus that grants you access. Our prayers can be as offensive as they can be powerful. Intimacy relates to conversation, and this is a conversation with God. We've heard a long time, but see, Lord, the harvest to send for workers. If, if you don't become the answer to that prayer, that is an unbelievably offensive thing to God because God will always send his own. And the minute that you pray it, he went, I put that in your heart. <laughs> and now I'm sending you. And there you go to Guatemala to speak this gospel to another people. And so it is to pray, forgive us our debts while refusing to forgive, forgive another is offensive, even an evidence of an unregenerate heart. Now, how does this work in real time? Because I just told you, I've been struggling. I've been really struggling. I've been holding my forgiveness with a brother, and it's been tearing me apart. And I'm going, Lord, I don't want to do it because I'm right and he's wrong. Does that mean I'm going to be sent to the torturers for all of eternity? <laughs> well, probably if in the context of this sermon, I simply just still refused. I would have to question the state of my heart. But by God's grace, the same spirit that nudged me, invited me into his kingdom in my state and said, I'll pay the price. You can't afford the tuition, not even close. That same spirit this week nudged. Why don't you take care of that? You've received my grace. Would you just apply that to someone else as an expression of obedience and in faith and in love? to myself. I think about Jesus on the cross. And what did he say? Father, forgive them. Because Stephen, in his last moments, looking at the stones coming his direction, Father, forgive them. And so it has been with God's own ever since. People like you and me, brothers and sisters, young and old, have lived with that heart place of gratitude that says, you know what? It's okay. Forgive them because I understand what it means. To be forgiven. This benediction as we close. Short and sweet out of Ephesians. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other. Just as in Christ. God forgive you. Father for this church. The devil would tear it apart. But he had a chance. And he will go at the core of our relationship with Jesus. Where the currency of forgiveness is so central Lord. And he would confuse our understanding and he would permit that we receive that grace but not apply it to another. And Lord, churches have come apart at the seams over this very issue. Lord, brothers and sisters, maybe in this room or in this town, live in duress relationship because they've just taken on the truth of the enemy and not the authority of your word. And so, Lord, I don't know who it is that you're speaking to this morning, but thank you for speaking to me. Thank you for giving me this word. And if by your grace and other, Lord, give them the faith to go do what they need to do to apply your forgiveness to a brother or sister. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much, guys.